So far, we've been working with just a single executable, and life's been, well, pretty simple. But there's a whole chain of technologies under the hood that we haven't really talked about. So what really happens when we build our executable is, well, there's pre-processing, compilation, and then linking. And this graphic is just beautiful because it really summarizes what happens. You have a preprocessor that goes through, looks at your headers and source, and figures out what really needs to happen. You have the compiler that takes all of that and compiles it into what are called object files. These object files are then run through what's called a linker, which creates your actual executable, the thing that you're actually running. But it gets even more in depth. So this executable does not live in its own little universe. So let's say this is your executable. It can use multiple libraries, and these libraries can use other libraries. So what are really libraries? Well, libraries are just a collection of code that don't directly execute themselves, but that can be called by executables. So this is where the term code reuse comes in. Let's say you have this really awesome class called cat, and the cat does this cool thing called meow, and you want other programs and other programmers across the world to use your code. You just simply put it in a library, give them instructions on how to use it, and they can add it to their program, and they can make the cat meow all day long. This graphic's beautiful. This really summarizes what I'm talking about. This is called Dependency Walker, and it exists on Windows. Don't worry, you don't need Windows to follow along, but this is just a really good graphic. So you have your stooges.exe, and then you have your Larry, Curly, and Mo DLLs, or Dynamic Link Libraries. They're called libraries or system objects or libs, uh, depending on your operating system. But basically, you have an executable, and it depends on certain libraries. Some of these libraries, like kernel32, are already built into your operating system, but it's still needed for your application to run. And if something's missing, for example, you see how curly's in red, well, it's not going to run. And we'll demonstrate that. But you should also understand there's multiple ways of doing this as well. That's right, life in programming is never simple. So there exists the concept of a static build versus a shared build. So static is you take all those libraries that we talked about, and you put them into the executable. So you just have one giant, and I do mean giant, binary file that you hand the end user. And you may be thinking, well, that's very convenient, and I love that. However, it comes with some complexity, it comes with some cost, and, well, you could really run into some issues. Some of those issues would be legal. For example, you would be breaking license terms and agreements, things of that nature. Other technologies just simply won't work because they're expecting to be in a shared format. Shared has a much smaller footprint, a much smaller deployment, especially when you go into multiple applications. And multiple applications can use the same code base. So as this is updated, multiple applications can take advantage of that. The problem with shared, though, is if you change this and it has some breaking feature, you're not just risking breaking one application, but multiple. Whew. That's complex. So take, let's take a look at an example here. We're going to create a new other subders project. And let's call this Qt Qtcore Advanced 3.1. And we're just going to finish it immediately. It's going to say, what do you want to add to this? And I'm actually going to close out of that and just show you the project file. It just simply says template subders. So there's absolutely nothing in this. We're just going to add a new subder project, go to application, add a console application. Let's call this my app. Next, next, finish. And it's just going to generate a bare bones application that we've done dozens and dozens of times. See, ta-da! So you may be thinking that this is something new, but actually, when we've worked with, say, network and concurrent, and we've sun we've done this, really, what we're doing under the hood is we're adding the network library. That's just cute ways of doing built-in cute libraries. We're going to make our own library and actually put it into this application. So let's go ahead, right click, and let's add a new sub project. Let's go to library, and we really only have one option, C++ library, but notice it says shared or static. Remember shared, self-explanatory, it can be used across multiple applications. Shared or static is a little bit confusing because shared means that it can be shared, static means it's built into the executable. So. We're going to do shared, but you could also do statically linked or a cute plugin. Plugin's a different topic we're also going to cover, and basically what it means is you can dynamically use that library across 
different applications as long as it follows a specific interface. So we're going to do shared. Let's call this my lib. All right, now select required modules. Modules, what does that mean? Well, remember, network, when we added it up here. So really, these are just libraries. That's right, Qt is sectioned off into libraries. So Qt itself really isn't an executable. Qt is, well, a series of libraries. And we've been using Qt Core this whole time. We've also worked with network and concurrency. So when in doubt, we're just going to leave Qt Core, hit next. And oh, finally, something we're familiar with, classes. So this is going to create a class called mylib with a header and a source file. Next, next, finish. And then it'll take just a moment. But now we have this beautiful subdirs project that has two subdirectories, the application and the library. The app, of course, has its own project file. And notice how it's a console application where the library, well, template equals lib. So this is not a direct executable, although it has code that we can execute. We're not going to execute this directly. The library has to be called from an application. So let's look at the structure of our library real quick. It contains a global file and a header file. Notice they're both really headers. So if we crack open this global, it's got some preprocessor directives. We've got a define in here. So if defined my lib underscore library, then we're going to export. Otherwise, we're going to import. So what's the difference here? These are called symbols. You need to export symbols. And it sounds really complex, but what's going on under the hood is we're basically saying when we export, what we export is available to the application. And we're getting this my shared lib right here. So class, and then we're declaring my lib shared underscore export my lib. So this whole class is going to be exported which basically means everything this class has that's public is available to the outside world. Now we're going to say, uh, actually, let me change my rhythm here. We're going to add QDebug, our trusty friend that's been with us since the beginning. And we're going to make a very, very simple function here. Don't want to get mired in complexity on coding. We just want to understand the core concepts here. We're going to do something we've done a hundred times. This is a test from my lib. Help if we spell from correctly. So you notice right off the bat that my lib includes my global. And under the hood, well, we've got some other complexity going on. We have an export and an import. The export is saying, hey, export these symbols, meaning export this class so other things can use it. The import is saying, hey, import this class so that we can use it. It's a little kind of tricky to wrap your head around until we do this. What we want to do is make this library available to this program. So we're going to right click. We're going to add library. And notice right off the bat, we have some choices, internal, external system or package. So internal library means it's internal to our project. External means it's outside of our project. And system means it belongs on the system. It's probably already installed. System package is very similar, but much, much more complex. So we're going to do internal because we want to import this mylib because it's in our project. And we get this drop down. That's right. You can have multiple of these. Choose what platforms you want. And then we have some platform specific features. For example, Mac can be a library framework that gets into a whole separate topic. Just leave it as default. In Windows, we can set up a special you know, directory structure here. We're just going to leave everything as default. Make sure mylib is selected. Next. And then we get some stuff that makes no sense, but we're going to talk about it. So really what's happening here is in our applications project file, it added a few lines and it's just literally saying win32 config. So windows config release, do this windows config debug, do this else. If it's not windows do this instead. All right. So what's going on here is actually kind of confusing. So you see how it says libs plus equal. So basically we're adding a library plus equal. The uppercase L denotes that this is the path that we're going to use. Whenever you see dollar dollar inside of a project file, we're basically declaring a variable. So dollar dollar output. 
So we're going to output the print working directory. That's a little confusing, but basically we're saying specifies the full path leading to the directory where QMake places the generated make file. Places the generated make file, meaning the compile directory where this executable is actually going. So we want to go up a parent and then we're going to the mylib folder and then the release version because this is release. Or if it's debug, we're doing the debug. The under, or I'm sorry, the dash, lowercase l, the under, I don't know where I got that from. Lowercase l, this is the actual file name. So really looking at this seems a lot less confusing. We're saying take your platform, take your configuration, whatever that may be, whether it's release or debug, then add your library. The library's path is this. The library file name is this. Whew. All right, then you have include path and depend path. And this is a little bit confusing, but think of it in terms of this is when compilation happens. It needs to know what we want to include. And this is after it's been compiled and you want to run it. Where are we actually looking for that library? And really, that gets really confusing out on forums. A lot of people get it confused, and I myself have gotten it confused numerous times. And sometimes it literally will make no sense. You'll compile and nothing happens the way you suspect. Go ahead and save all. Now, just to double check, we've got that in there. Nothing's really changed in here. We should be good to go. And we're gonna just go in here and let's go ahead and add some files. So we're going to include, and we want to go up a notch, go to mylib, and we want to add the mylib global because we want to import. If you skip this step, you won't be able to use it because what we're doing here is we're saying, if define mylib, which in this project is not defined, then we want to import the mylib shared. So we're basically saying import Ta-da, this guy, this whole class. Let's jump back here and let's actually import that class now. And we're going to say mylib test. So we're actually calling the test function in mylib, this guy here. But we're calling it in our application. Now comes the critical part. We're just going to build everything. Notice how, right off the bat, cannot find, and it says lowercase l mylib. Now, because lowercase, we know that means that's the name. So it can't actually find it. We'll go out to our folder, and sure enough, there it is. So why can't it find it? What's going on here? Sometimes it gets a little confused. So what I'd recommend, if you jump into this problem, you just rebuild your library. Make sure you got a good build. Now, rebuild your application, and voila, suddenly it finds it. And you can actually now build this, and everything just works. And let's make some minor change. That way it knows that this file's changed and we need to rebuild this. So let's go ahead and build this. And ta-da, it just works. So if you ever get one of those can't find blah, 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 try rebuilding your library and then try rebuilding your application and do those separately. Sometimes Qt Creator's not that friendly when it does that. Now we should have this beautiful My App file sitting out here. Let's go ahead and run this. Ta-da, this is a test for my lib. So the application's actually calling the function in the library. Pretty sweet. Now, if we go out here and we open this guy up, and I just want to see the dependencies, what's going on here. You can see we've got a lot of dependencies here, but we also have a problem, not found. And it's, of course, my lib. Dot so dot one not found. There's numerous ways to fix this, but what's really going on under the hood is this is an operating system problem, not a cute problem. And if we try to run this application, we're going to get a big fat error. 
let me actually do that again. My app, error while loading shared library. My lib not found, meaning same problem we had before where it's just not finding the library. This will drive you insane. Some operating systems, you can actually just copy and paste the library directly into the same, app, same directory as your application. We can try that, but I'm not convinced it's going to really work. So let's go back in here and let's go into my app, paste this. And let's do same thing, not found. I'm very confident that if I try to run this, it's not going to work. So what's going on under the hood is what's called a search order or a search path. And every operating system is a little bit different. Windows, you probably could get away with just throwing the, the DLLs in the same folder. Um, but you would look for what's called a path. And we're going to echo out. Our path here and this is the search order for this computer and you can see it's looking in user local s bin user local bin so i would put it there but the problem is i may not actually have well permission to write there and if i don't then it becomes a chicken or the egg problem how do i get the library somewhere where it can find it this is where you really deep dive into your operating systems documentation so because i'm on linux i'm going to use what's called an ld so i'm going to say ld library Path, which basically says, hey, we're going to modify the path search order here just this one time. We're going to say my lib, and we want to run it in my app. So what we're doing here is we're saying LD set the library path to my lib, meaning the current directory subfolder my lib, and we're going to run my app. So I need to actually Grab these, shove them right in there. So now they're in this subfolder. And let's run it. Ta da! This is a test from my lib. So that's a very frustrating problem you're going to really get stuck with. And this is why you would need a deployment structure or a setup program of some type, which we'll cover in a future tutorial. But I want you to be aware of this problem now in case you get really excited to make an app and then it just doesn't work. So when in doubt, when you're missing something, check your search order, check your documentation for your operating system, and know that LD library path is widely used on Linux, but it's not the most recommended way. Let's just face it, Qt is extremely complex and has a massive learning curve, but once you learn it, you can do just about anything. Unfortunately, learning Qt is a challenge in itself, and if you've tried learning straight from the docs, you've probably become easily frustrated. While they do a really good job, they're arguably some of the best documentation in the world, they don't go that extra step and leave a lot of people guessing what to do. How do all these things interconnect? That's why I started developing videos. I've done videos not just on my own YouTube channel, which you're watching now, but also on the official Q Studios channel. And I've started doing video courses out on Udemy.com. Right now, I have the Qt Core series. It covers beginners, intermediate, and advanced, so it'll take you straight from Hello World all the way up to building a complex, multi-threaded, encrypted TCP server. On top of that, if you don't want any of this, you can still join the Voidrooms Facebook group, which has a pretty flourishing group of developers, and we discuss everything, not just cute. I hope to see you there.